live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's the Science Cafe with your host, Chris Smith. All right, everybody, let's get started. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thanks for coming out on a, just a little bit of a chilly night. My name is Chris. I am your host, and this is the Science Cafe. I'm glad you're all here. We've got an exciting show for you tonight. Uh, somebody that I'm very excited to hear from myself. I hope that you are too. Uh, we are now, let's see, this is going to be, this is the first Science Cafe of 2024. Happy New Year, everybody. I might not have seen you, uh, but I'm so glad you're here. Uh, for tonight's topic, it's called Bugs in Motion, which I feel is very, uh, it's concise and it's simple. And you can see the gorgeous imagery that's already playing on the screens here in the cafe. Uh, and all of this stuff comes from tonight's guest speaker, who is Dr. Adrian Smith. Uh, Adrian is the head of the Evolutionary Biology and Behavior Lab here at the museum. And when I mentioned that, like, this is Bugs in Motion is like, a very neat and concise title. I think it kind of describes some of the content that he makes. It's full of information. It's full of, I mean, just beauty. But in its simplicity, it is incredible. And I think in a way, that's sort of what Dr. Smith specializes in, at least with the videos and the content that he creates and puts out on his YouTube channel, Ant Lab, which has, I think, today more than a quarter of a million subscribers. It's close to a quarter. OK, everybody in here, if you don't already, make sure you go to YouTube and subscribe to the Ant Lab channel. Uh, because I mean, if you're not already, you want to be, because it's, it's some of the best content on all of the internet. It has to be. Uh, so we're close to a quarter of a million people who enjoy this stuff. Uh, and I like it, because it has the museum's name on it. Thanks, Adrian, for doing that. We get to be associated with some of the great stuff that he's doing. But additionally, Dr. Smith is also a professor and teaches over at North Carolina State University. And so it's not only making cool stuff for the internet, but it's also feeding into the science and research that happens in the lab here at the museum uh, as part of his joint appointment between the museum and NC State University. So not only do you get to see the cool imagery and the cool videos, you get to learn cool stuff about the natural world and about the lives and behaviors of insects and other arthropods. And I think that's pretty exciting stuff. I think you're going to enjoy it. So I'm going to turn the stage over to Dr. Adrian Smith. All right. Thanks, Chris. Hey, everybody. Uh, nice to see everybody out at the museum tonight. Um, so yeah, as Chris said, I, I work here in my labs in this building uh, on the th uh, third floor. And I'm an entomologist, so I'm going to show you a lot and a lot of bug stuff tonight. And there, I brought some bugs too, which I'll pass out later. Um, they're in cages, don't worry. Um, so this is where I work, here on the third floor, and that's my lab. It's one of the glass-walled uh, on-exhibit research labs. Um, and if you didn't know, this museum has a mission statement, and this is it. It's to illuminate the natural world and inspire its conservation. So what I try to do with my work is to sort of work in those two domains, that idea of illuminating the natural world and inspiring uh, conservation or more appreciation for the natural world. So my work does both those things in these ways, and I'm going to talk about both those things tonight. Um, as a scholar, as a, as a researcher here, um, I, of course, research and try to discover new things about the natural world and then publish them for my peer scientists in peer-reviewed scientific journals. And so my work comes out you know, as a science paper. But then at the same time, it's really important to me personally and to everybody in my lab and to this museum, I think, as a whole, is to try to make our work accessible to an interested public audience, you all here. Um, so I do that in, in terms of running the lab and doing events and, and speaking and things like this. But I also make media. I have a passion for making media and publishing media. And the media that I make comes out a bunch of different places. Of course, YouTube. But it also, uh, for the past four upcoming five seasons on PBS, I every, every year produce a bunch of segments for their show, Sci-NC, so that people across North, North Carolina can sort of get a glimpse of what's happening in the lab and sort of the the micro wildlife all around them. And so uh, 
as I said, primarily my stuff comes out on, on YouTube first and foremost, and then gets edited for other places. And about 10 to 50 million people watch the content that we generate out of the lab every year. And all of it is themed around arthropods and themed around the process of science and discovery around that. Um, so if you would have gone back in time and uh, told eight-year-old Adrian uh, what exactly it is that 39-year-old Adrian is representing himself as and doing for a job, I would have been mind blown and also very confused. Like, you do what? You study insects for a job? Like, you can do that and it's not pest control? That's, that's bizarro. <laughs> Like, there's no way. So I never met anybody who did what I do as a job. Uh, as a kid, I, my, my immediate family did not graduate from college. Um, I don't know any entomologists growing up. So I was completely clueless about it. Had no idea. Um, I got started in this uh, when I went to college. I grew up in Florida, on the Gulf Coast of Florida, about 20 miles north of Tampa. And I applied to two colleges. I applied to University of Florida and Florida State University because those were the universities in Florida. I got into one. I showed up day one. I didn't even visit. I was like, OK, I guess this is it. I'm here. What's college? Um, and I needed a job. And so my bio 101 professor happened to be this guy. And he needed someone to wash dishes in his lab. And I was like, that's great. Let's do that. It sounds interesting. What's a lab? Let's walk in there. And this guy sort of changed the trajectory of my life. This was, a, this was Professor Walter Schinkel. He's retired now, but he was a professor at Florida State University. Um, he uh, spent his career researching ants. Uh, a lot of, he wrote a book, a giant book on fire ants. And one of the things he's sort of better known for is inventing the process of, of nest architecture, of going out into the field, melting metal or, or plaster and pouring it into an ant nest and digging it out so you can study the three-dimensional shapes of ant, underground ant nests and their architecture. You can find these pieces uh, both in the scientific literature. He kind of invented that whole field, but also in museums across the US and across the world. You can see uh, some of that. And you can actually see some of it up in my lab in the glass window, too. Um, so that's how I discovered that you could do this as a living. And the thing about Walter is he is one of these ant researchers uh, that studies ants for their own sake. Although he did work a lot on fire ants, he was more interested in describing the biology, natural history, behavior, sort of lives of these critters more than being concerned about how to get rid of them or prevent them from coming in your house or, or any sort of, sort of uh, pest control applications. And that really kind of instilled in me that you could do this for a living. You could, you could study and learn about organisms for their own sake. So from there, I started doing it. This is me uh, in college in a hole. Uh, I'm six foot four. I'm standing up in a pit that I dug uh, to dig out a harvester ant nest. And I could not get myself out of the pit. Someone had to come by and actually uh, give me a hand to get me out of the pit. Uh, so incredible things that you, you have to do to actually get ants out of the ground. Um, and there on the picture on the right, um, I'm in the western US in Colorado. Uh, experiencing a mating flight of ants. And these western harvester ants, when they leave their nests to fly and, and mate and mate an event, they lek at the highest spot in the local area. And so that's me standing on top of the highest spot. So I, I am the, the ground zero for the mating event um, happening on me there. And so from there, he went to went to get a, a PhD at, at Arizona State University. And that's really when I started thinking about filming ants and filming insects and describing their behavior for the first time. So my work there was, was all about internal conflict in ant nests and how ants sort of tell who should reproduce, who shouldn't, who belongs in the nest, who shouldn't, who's a queen, who isn't, all that stuff. And all that work was really capturing what the insects were doing and then describing it and sort of figuring out what are the sort of things that they're using to to, to sort of decide what they're doing for their behaviors. Uh, that, that image on the white background there is a queen attacking one of her uh, daughter workers that has become reproductive. The only way to stop that worker from reproducing is the queen herself has to physically attack her. So she touches her with her antennae, gets really angry, and starts biting her and spraying her with a chemical. Um, so I spent a long time doing this. Um, here's another image. Uh, it looks like there's one ant in the middle being held up like she kicked the game winning goal in a soccer match. She didn't. Ants don't play soccer, turns out. Um, what she did is actually uh, committed the moral 
Wilson of becoming a reproductive worker, and those are all her sister workers physically attacking her to make her reabsorb her ovaries and become a worker instead of a reproductive. Uh, some of the sort of internal strife and conflict that keeps ant colonies functional. So all doing this work, there was a persistent question in the back of my mind, because remember, I hadn't met anybody that did this, and I still didn't really know why. Like, I knew I was interested in it. I knew it was cool. I knew describing nature was inherently interesting. But like, as a public good, like, do we need to know why ants underground in southeastern Arizona fight amongst themselves? Really? All of, most of science is publicly supported through taxpayer funding. And it's a constant question being brought up about why should we, as a society, support natural history research or basic biological research. In fact, this was brought to a head when I was getting started in this at, at Arizona. Um, at the time I was doing my studies, uh, a partisan report came out, and it was authored by one of the state uh, senators of Arizona, John McCain. And he had this to say in a press conference, I had no idea that so much expertise concerning ants resided in the major universities of my state, McCain quipped. I must say that with an element of pride, but, there's the killer butt, I'm not sure that it's deserving of these taxpayer dollars. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. That describes exactly my work and the work of my advisors that he's talking about directly. It turns out that basic biology, basic description of the natural world for its own sake, natural history research, what this museum is sort of founded on, is constantly in question. Because it's constantly, it's supported largely by public funding. And this has been happening years and years all, all the time. It's not just museum research. It's, it's any sort of description of basic biological research. Um, things are published by partisan reports uh, as examples of government misspending, like when the National Science Foundation, Department of Defense gives money to a researcher to study how shrimp fight with each other. Um, they put out a thing called a waste book, or it used to be called the Golden Fleece Award, sort of putting that into question, like why are we paying for this research? So I tell you all this because these two questions really sort of are in my mind almost every day as I come here and do my research is as I'm sort of a, a built my career around addressing these two things like you do what like again I'd never been exposed to this as a as a kid it's growing up and then who cares like what is the purpose of this like what is the value of all this work and so my answer uh, to both of these things is the media publishing that I do so this is, those, those are the core sort of questions I'm answering with every single YouTube video, PBS segment that I, that I put out into the world. I'm trying to represent sort of what it is that I do, what it is my colleagues do, and why, and why it's important, um, and why it's interesting to think about. So let's get into that. Uh, okay, back to that mission statement of this museum exists and we're sort of uh, working towards illuminating the natural world and inspiring uh, its conservation and people's ethics towards the natural world. So what I do as an entomologist is largely visualize the behavior and natural history of insects and one of the purposes of that is to inspire. So uh, one of the things I really love to do is film natural sort of wildlife all around us. So I'm going to show you just a rapid fire sort of sequences of things you can find literally in your backyard. I know because I found them all in my backyard and I just live here in Raleigh. Does anybody know what this is? Maple. Yes, rosy maple moth. It kind of looks like a Muppet uh, from the Jim Henson studio, but it is a real animal and really lives right here. Amazing. Um, here's another moth that you might find in your backyard. Uh, virgin tiger moth. Spectacular colors on this thing. You'll find these in you know June or July. If you uh, put out a black light in your backyard, it'll probably come to it. Here's one of my favorite uh, backyard moths. It's one of our uh, biggest moths. It's not the biggest. Uh, this is a polyphemus moth. It's a giant flying 80s carpet, sort of. Um, if you look when it raises its wings, you'll see the eye spots that have transparent sort of windows that you can see right through. And on the top of them, they kind of look like um, eye spots of a larger sort of predator. One of the more amazing things. These things don't feed as adults. They just kind of fly around, mate, lay eggs. That's it. Beetles in your backyard. Here's an acorn weevil. 
Um, if I were able to fly, it would probably look as awkward and gangly as this little dude. Um, you'll see as it, as it gets into the air here. <laughs> right? Right? A for effort. And A for style. Why not? Uh, here's something you'll see in June. This is? Exactly. Yep. A firefly. That's what they look like. You can see the light organ at the tip of its abdomen, that yellow part there. Uh, here's a, a grapevine beetle. Uh, this is an incredibly huge beetle. It's kind of like a flying ping pong ball. Uh, really cool. You can see the uh, beetles have, like, like all insects, have two pairs of wings. And the, the front wing is modified into things called elytra, which are hardened, protective cases. And you can see the elytra flapping along uh, with the longer hind wings. Flies. What's that? Yes. Yes. What's that? Flies? Yes, so flies have four wings. Uh, the hind wing is modified into a halter, which is that little chicken wing sort of uh, uh, thing that's uh, flapping up and down, that little drumstick-like thing. Uh, that's a modified uh, hind wing that's turned into a gyroscope uh, uh, for actually balancing an orientation in the air. This is a cheese fly. Um, found this one in, in um, Eno River State Park. Uh, this is a compost fly or a soldier fly. Uh, these are beautifully iridescent, and you'll find these, uh, you know, by your garbage can, uh, and they're pretty common. Here is one of my favorite things that I've uh, recently filmed. Uh, believe it or not, this is a fly that has lost almost all of its wings. Uh, it has two, it still has the flapping hall tears, and it almost lost all of its head. It barely has a head. It looks like a little crab or a spider. Does anybody know what this is? A bat fly. Maybe you watched the video. Yes, this is an ectoparasite of bats. It lives and feeds off of a bat. Um, I went out with Lisa. Her, Lisa, um, our uh, collections manager for mammals, and here you can see in real time what it looks like on the fur of a bat. You'll see it scurry here in a second. Yeah, it is kind of you. It's very fast. It's hard to get off a bat. It's going to run right into the bat's ear there and hang out. But it lives most of its life on the fur of a bat um, and feeds off, takes blood meals off the bat. It will not feed off of anything but a bat. Yeah. It didn't feed off of me. Uh, I brought it back in the lab. It only survived for about maybe 12 hours off the bat. Um, but these things hadn't really been filmed like this before. Uh, so it was a real honor to be able to actually catch one of these and film it. And so uh, I, I put this out there, and I get surprising sort of results and feedback from uh, a public audience. And one of my favorite forms of that is, uh, is building new collaborations outside of science. So um, I have several art collaborations that have come out of just posting sort of these images of insects, uh, you know, doing things like flying or, or walking or doing whatever they're doing in, in terms of behavior. This is one. Um, <coughs> One collaboration that uh, is, is, is really interesting to me, this is a, a Spanish uh, photographer, Xavi, who films, uh, films birds and flocks of birds in flight, and then takes that imagery and decomposes it into its single frames, and then, and then combines all those frames so you can see the trajectory of the flying you know, uh, flocks of birds. And he's mostly just worked on birds, but he saw my stuff, and we've been having a collaboration for the last three years. Um, you haven't seen it yet because it's not public, but it will be public in National Geographic this April. So we'll have five images in the April, edition, April uh, issue of National Geographic, and I can't show you those right now, Senator Green, um, but uh, they will be coming out uh, soon. So catch that on the newsstand in April. And all of the butterflies that you saw when the title slide was going were all filmed uh, in, oops, in our butterfly exhibit uh, in the NEC, Nature Exploration uh, Center. And that is part of an art collaboration, too. Uh, this, is on, this is Andrea. Uh, he's a 
sort of a, a studio artist, an installation artist that installs these um, sort of immersive experiences in galleries. And uh, we're working on a project right now where all those butterflies in flight right here from the museum sort of fill and populate an art gallery eventually. Um, so that was all filmed a few months ago uh, for an art collaboration. Okay, let's get to some more of the science though. Um, so, of course, I also film insects to discover things in, as my work as a professional entomologist. So, let me introduce you to two uh, really extraordinary things here. Um, before I introduce you to those uh, insects, uh, one is an insect, one's a former insect, uh, let's talk about some of the things insects do. So, a lot of insects jump. Uh, what you just saw was a, a mantis nymph. Uh, jumping. So mantises, as they're adults, they, most of them have wings. Uh, as, as juveniles, they don't have fully developed wings yet, um, but they still do jump uh, pretty gracefully. So a lot, of th a lot of things jump just using their legs, like, like we jump, with direct muscle action, pushing off the ground. Here's a Gigantiops destructor, one of the best ant names in existence, jumping onto a pencil. They're really friendly ants. If you stick your finger in front of them, they'll just jump and hang out with you. It's pretty great. Uh, here is a cockroach. Sorry to tell you that cockroaches jump too. Uh, if you didn't know, if you haven't personally experienced this, uh, here's a um, American cockroach jumping into a, a, a short wing-powered flight. All of those are insects that jump like we do, but there's a whole bunch of insects that jump using a spring-loaded mechanism. Uh, perhaps the most famous of these is um, are the uh, grasshoppers. Uh, these are American bird grasshoppers, and they have a combination of direct muscle action, but also a spring-loaded component in their hind legs that they can use to jump off the ground. Um, this is a cat flea, uh, one of the most famous spring-loaded jumpers. And here you see a cat flea. I think this was captured at about 40,000 frames per second. That's how fast they are. They're kind of like, like a, a parasitic bullets flying through the air. Uh, this is one of the things I enjoyed least to film in the lab. Uh, I'm happy to say we don't have any cat fleas left in the lab, and we did not enhance the, viewer, the visitor experience with fleas, as far as I know. <laughs> so that's good. Uh, this is a plant hopper. Uh, these are very common insects, uh, and one of the most well-described spring-loaded jumping systems. Yeah, some of them are coordinated, some of them aren't. Um, they jump, and then they also spread their wings in mid-jump to sort of uh, control their jumps a little bit more and flutter and fly away. Uh, these are very common. You find these in your backyard uh, all the time. <laughs> yeah, pretty incredible things. That one goes into a flight right after that. Um, so all this, uh, I use the term spring-loaded, but the scientific term for this is actually a little bit more complicated. These are referred to as latch-mediated, spring-actuated systems, which means basically that uh, it's not all about the spring. There are other components that make it work. And all of these components kind of work like a, like a mousetrap. So the muscle action that powers these is loaded over a long period of time. For a mousetrap, that's when you take the sort of um, striking component and then put your energy into it by stretching the spring back and, and loading it back. And then it's held in place, of course, by the trigger and by the latch. So that's the little bar that you flip over that, and then into the little latch, which the, the rodent will touch. And so that latch uh, and its release mechanism is what actually makes the thing happen. That's the sort of um, latch-mediated part of it. So all these components are in all those insect systems, too. There's muscle action that's deforming an internal spring, usually, and then that's held in place by a latch that the insect can simultaneously, can sort of instantaneously release, and then release instantaneously all that stored energy, just like a mousetrap would work. There, it, this doesn't just happen in legs, either. Uh, this is another backyard insect that has a, a, a famous spring-loaded system. This is a um, click beetle. Part of its thorax it has a little thing sticking out of its thorax. It works as its latch. It loads that up and sort of can catapult itself many body lengths into the air. A pretty incredible organism. It's pretty cool to jump without legs, without using your legs. This is probably the, the fastest you know, ab abdominal crunch you'll ever see. Uh, here's a fly maggot. They use their whole bodies as a spring, some of them, where they curl up and use their two little mouth hooks to, to latch onto themselves, build up pressure, and then the, the hooks slip, and they sort of jump 
you know, they don't even have legs, but they're jumping with a spring-loaded mechanism. Pretty incredible. Uh, and of course, here's one of my favorite organisms, the trap jaw ant, which has spring-loaded mandibles that work kind of as a bear trap. They can snap against a thing, like if they snap against a solid thing like my finger, and throw itself many body lengths away. So part of my work is, is trying to find new versions of this, which, believe it or not, a lot of them are undescribed. And here's one just from NC State's campus. This is from a dead tree. Uh, on campus, it's in between my office and my friend uh, Matt Bertone, who's a state entomologist who works at NC State. Um, Matt's a much better entomologist than I am. When he sees a dead tree infected with a fungus, that's his afternoon. Like, that's like, just hold my calls, folks. I'm going to be at this tree for a while. So that's what he did, and he found uh, this really interesting beetle larvae. Uh, the adult here is at the bottom, and the larva is at the top here. And he saw it doing something weird, and he's like, calls me up and said, you should really film this. And I'm like, you, I agree. Let's do it, Matt. Uh, and this is what it does in real time. It can crawl around it and crawl around and move with its legs. But then all of a sudden, it sort of stops and then disappears. It's like a, a magic trick happening here. This is real time, what it looks like. And that's what Matt saw. And that's what Matt was like, we should really work on this together. And so we did. And here's what it looks like in slow motion. What's using, it's, it's, it's doing a version of the using your whole body as a spring. And and throwing itself into the air. Once it's in the air, it turns itself into a wheel, and it curls up, and then it hits the ground, bounces, and rolls on the ground once it's, it's up in the air. Um, it turns out nothing else uh, that was known jumps like this. This is a completely new uh, mechanism. So to describe this mechanism, uh, this is probably one of the best imaged beetle larvae on Earth now. Uh, we did a whole bunch of different techniques. Like on the left and the gray images, those are scanning electron microscopes of the beetle's underside of its head and the, the, um, uh, the legs and the, the tarsal claws at the end. Um, those are the points that are in contact with the ground. And then the spinning thing on the right is a micro CT scan, so we can visualize all the internal musculature. And we did that in order to see what are the components that make this work. What's the spring? What could be the latch? Um, and how does this thing actually jump? And what we figured out is that it almost has no special anatomy. All it's doing is gripping onto the ground with its tiny little tarsal claws. When one of those, as it's flexing its body, sort of up into an arch. When its claws slip from the ground, it's, it can curl its body underneath itself rapidly, and that throws it into the ground. It's kind of like a sort of a popping mechanism like this. And it's special because it's the worst at doing this. It's the worst, the slowest spring-loaded jumping thing that we know of, which is interesting to us because it's able to do this with no special anatomy. A lot of those insects that I showed you before have specialized parts, specialized components of their mousetrap. This one has none. Um, so this is the first description of it, um, and we're still hope to work on this, although these are hard to find, and we sort of had a mad dash to just do what we could do before you know, the NC State arborist came down, chopped the tree, and th threw it into the wood chipper, and all the beetles were gone. So hopefully we'll find more of them in the future. So let's go from the best uh, to, or from the worst to the best. And I'm going to show you a little bit about globular springtails. Has anybody seen a globular springtail before? A few of you. OK. For the rest of you, I have really good news. My buddy Chris here is going to hand out some globular springtails. Uh, don't worry, they don't bite. But I want you to look at them. These are, I just collected these from my yard uh, today. Uh, and feel free to pass them around if, it, if, uh, if you don't get lucky with the first viewing of a box here. In each box, there's you know, half a dozen or so of them in there. And I want you to get an appreciation for the size of these things. Uh, columbula, or springtails, are one of the most common soil arthropods on Earth. Um, they're almost everywhere, and they're one of the most abundant sort of forms of arthropods. They live in the soil, and they eat you know, microbes and bacteria, fungus. Uh, in the soil. And, you know, in your yard, around the sidewalks here, you, there's at least half a dozen species, probably way more than that. There's at least half a dozen in my yard. These globular ones you'll find out right now. Um, so they are winter active around here. Uh, they appear in January and, and disappear sort of at mid to end of March. Let me show you what they do. 
Okay, so as, you, as you're going around, I appreciate how small they are. You might be able to see their special, special ability, but here is them on my back patio. And you're gonna see uh, where they get their name Springtail from here in a second. They're kind of cute little arthropods. Uh, this big thing that's gonna appear from the right-hand side is my finger. And there the Springtail disappeared. You can see it again. It's gone. And here's frame by frame with just a normal camera. So in 1 60th of a second, that springtail left these little curly Q streaks. That's what it was doing in 1 60th of a second. Right? And now here, I'm going to show you what it looks like uh, in super slow motion. This is it. It has a, has a appendage, spring-loaded appendage. It slaps out from underneath its body, and it catapults itself back flipping into the air. One thing that's cool about springtails, there's a lot of things that are cool about springtails, especially globulars, is that these are one of the most common arthropods. They're everywhere, like I said. The ones that I studied, the ones that you're seeing now at your tables, are from my yard. In the history of science, in the history of our knowledge about springtails, um, there's only been two scientific studies describing their jumping behavior and trying to capture and visualize ever. One, the first in 1979, was shot at 1,200 frames per second. And when you film these things at 1,200 frames per second, you only get one frame between when they're on the ground and when they're off the ground. That's how fast they're moving. There was one other study in 20, 2013, but it was largely anecdotal, which means that only one or two individuals was used. So these things are largely undescribed. And the thing about springtails and the globulars is there's no other animal does a backflip faster than these things. Like it's on the extraordinary sort of end of the spectrum. So I've been working on these for years, uh, and I'm gonna show you uh, what we have visualized and what we know about how springtail, globular springtail jumps work. And it starts with this, again, taking it and doing micro CT scans to describe the internal musculature. And so all this is in the fourth abdominal segment. All these have big muscles that are likely distorting sort of hard sclerites that are body plates underneath their body and using that to build up a spring that gets released from that. Um, what you see on the right, these, vi these uh, video frames, are what it looks like when the, when the springtail unfolds. These ones are stuck on their back. And you can see it sort of detach from the body and get released. Uh, we tried to find a latch mechanism, but so far a latch mechanism has yet to be visualized. You can imagine uh, how hard it is to film things that are that small and especially film them at 18,000 frames per second, which you see here. Here's filming it from underneath the glass slide, so it's shooting up from underneath it and watching it jump off of that. Um, when they release their springtail, their, their furca, um, what they're doing is using that to sort of catapult themselves up. And here's the tip of one of their springtailed furcas. That's the, the tip, uh, they have a fork tip, and it ends in this serrated sort of thing. Uh, called the mucro, which is the very end of it. And that's what grips the ground and sends them up into the air. So they actually have like a serrated grip that interacts with the ground and pushes them up. And here you see uh, one filmed at 150,000 frames per second, if it'll play here. Oh, bummer. That one's not working. Hold on. There we go. Okay, so this is our best image that we have of how springtails jump. Let's see how it works. See the mucros, or the, the furca is slightly flexible, but also stiff, and so it's slapping uh, like in front of their body, of their um, center of mass, which sends them up, but also spinning backwards into a uh, extremely fast rotation. And it's only about uh, 2.8 milliseconds from the first movement to when they're off the ground. And they're doing this to escape from predators. Things like, like trap giants that have really fast predator sort of prey capture mechanisms. Uh, it's hard to catch a springtail because they're really good at jetting themselves out. Um, here's another view of it. Uh, here you can see a wider view of the liftoff and the first uh, a couple backflips here. Um, so there's almost nothing that rotates its body faster than uh, a springtail. Uh, there's a couple other insects that do, do flip, uh, things called psyllids or, or um, 
uh, things that feed off of plants and trees, uh, that they actually rotate frontwards. They do a front flip. Uh, and there's flea beetles that are about, you know, in the range of that. Um, but what it's doing is about rotating uh, at about 185 to upwards of 372 rotations per second uh, when it's flipping, which is just incredible to me. Um, and here's the whole trajectory of it. Uh, they're at their shoulder height. They're only about a millimeter off the ground, but they can throw themselves up to, you know, 62, 65 uh, millimeters in the air, so 60 times their, their body height, and then travel horizontally about the same distance too. You can see this one uh, hits the ground and bounces again uh, and rolls out of the way. So the last component of it is what they do when they hit the ground. So the last video we saw a uncontrolled landing uh, where it just rotates into the ground and keeps bouncing and rolling until it gets its feet under itself. But incredibly, they have this, this uh, uh, another appendage underneath their body that they usually use to groom. It's called the colophore or ventral tube. They use this to, to groom and sort of waterproof themselves. But they also, in mid-flight, about half of their jumps, they, they avert it and it works as a gr sticky grappling hook. So when they first encounter the ground, it sticks to the ground and anchors them to the ground so they can immediately stand up and anchor themselves. Um, all the stuff that I've shown you has not been filmed before. Um, some of it, the, all of this will, will come out uh, over the next year or so in three different scientific studies. Um, and most of it is already on YouTube uh, right now. So uh, as I've been doing this work and describing these, uh, both the globulars and other springtails, I've been telling this research story uh, through the media that I make. And again, this all gets back to sort of how I do science. For me, doing science is, is serving both audiences and putting those at equal footing. So it's, it means discovering things, describing things, and publishing those for my peer scientists. But it also means being able to show people and tell stories about the natural world that other people haven't, that I'm lucky enough to have a job where I can do that as, as part of my work. And I feel really fortunate for that, uh, but also um, spend a lot and make sure a lot of my time doing science means working towards that goal, too. Um, so with that, thanks for coming to the first Science Cafe of 2024. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Incredible stuff. Thanks. Really do have like the best visuals. I don't know. There's not very many <laughs> scientists, I feel like, who get stuff quite this good. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to ask the first question. And then if you've got questions, all you got to do is raise your hand. I'll bring you the microphone. That makes sure that everybody in the room can hear. But I'm a little interested in what it takes to get imagery like this. Mm -hmm. What's the setup in the lab so that you can get 250,000 frames per second yeah. on a springtail or something? Yeah, so I, I use high-speed cameras, specialized cameras. Um, the, the type of cameras I use are called phantom cameras, which you've, if you've You've probably seen these. These are things like if you've watched the Planet Earth documentary, the things that same cameras that they use to film, like the Great White jumping out of the, of the water in super slow motion. Or if you watch YouTube, if you've seen the slow mo guys, it's the same sort of cameras that they use. Um, and these are expensive pieces of equipment. And um, most scientists, most researchers have uh, that study things like this, which there are a lot, um, buy ones that just film in black and white because uh, they're only interested in kind of the data they produce. Uh, when I bought mine, um, I made sure to get color sensors, which sacrifices some of your ability to film at higher frame rates. But at the same time, I can make images like what you're seeing up here. Um, so I have a couple high-speed cameras and then uh, very powerful lights. Um, so most of the flying videos that you see are kind of escape flights, uh, where the light is flicked on and the insect immediately sort of evacuates the, the place. Um, most of them aren't attracted to lights that bright. Some of them are. Some of them fly at the lights. Um, but yeah, it's a combination of, of trial and error, sort of insect wrangling. Um, these are all filmed sort of in a back room that you can't see in my lab because it has a low ceiling, because I don't usually film in cages. So things fly up to the ceiling, and we have to be able to grab them. Um, so you know, after each one of these sequences, there's a 10-minute period of either like reaching up to the ceiling or crawling around on the ground trying to find the thing. As I said, it was bad for fleas. Like I did not enjoy filming fleas because of those reasons, um, but everything else is a little bit easier. 
Thanks. So what I'd like to know is if springtails are so difficult to catch, uh -huh. how did you get so many from your backyard? Oh, well, they're not act – well, okay, they're difficult to catch if you are if you're make a living off of eating them. Uh, luckily, we don't. Uh, and so what, all you have to do to get them is actually just um, – I take a bucket with a with the bottom cut out with a screen, and you just scoop up a bunch of leaf litter. We don't we don't have a, a grass yard. We just have a sort of a a mulched and natural scape yard. Just scoop that up, throw it into the bucket, and then shake it. And then all of the tiny little things that live in the soil in that soil layer fall out. So you'll get tiny beetles. You'll get pseudo scorpions. You'll get you know, uh, plant hoppers, leaf hoppers, sometimes spiders, tons of spiders, and you also get the buffet of springtails. And so, you know, all of these I collected, you know, in, in 20 minutes this afternoon in my, in my yard. What are some of the scientific findings that you've used to satisfy people like Glenn McCann and <laughs> I have not had the opportunity of being directly called out uh, by a government official yet. I, I relish the day when that happens. Um, but uh, describing new mechanisms like this is important because we don't know what's possible and we don't know all of the sort of inventions that nature could present to us, right? These are things that, that are doing things on a scale that we're incapable of engineering ourselves. And so every time we discover things like a new weird beetle that, that jumps in a way nothing has before, like this is a new possibility. This is a new way to accomplish a certain thing at a certain scale of which our own technology is currently not there. So a lot of researchers that do this type of work get funded by sort of the Office of Naval Research, the Department of Defense, because it's exploratory and it's like, Direct, some of it's directly applicable to designing micro robotics or designing, you know, search and rescue is a thing you'll hear time and time again for things, just studying how things move in sort of a small environment. Um, so all of that is directly applicable. I don't have any direct applications of the stuff that I study. I sort of leave that up there, and I feel like my role as a biologist and the type of biologist that I am is to describe things and put things out there and to raise public interest and appreciation uh, for things that are, again, like literally right in our backyards. Because if you don't, if there's no story, if, if, if a thing is nameless, faceless, and you don't have any reason to appreciate it, why would we expect anybody to appreciate it, right? Why would we expect a conservation ethic if you don't know what it is there in your backyard to conserve or to appreciate, right? So I feel like my role is describing that and giving people a reason to care and giving people ownership of the wildlife that might be directly outside their door. I think you answered my question because on things like public television, I've mm -hmm. seen insect hyperbats. Yeah. <laughs> and all, and they were. It seemed to me that I wish I'd paid more attention now, but it seemed to me that they were applying them to mechanics and to space and to all kinds of tra tra trajectories. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, so for sure. For sure, yes. Yes, they do. Yeah, there's a lot to learn from insects in terms of engineering and technology and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Remember, if you got questions, just wave me down. So looking at the movement of all of these, especially the springtails, uh -huh. uh, if humans tried to do that, we would be horribly dizzy. So I'm assuming that... Yeah. Springtails and insects don't get dizzy. Why not? Or <laughs> why don't they? And why do we? Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know what the answer to that is. Um, it's it's different uh, when you're on different scales. So uh, I, I can't directly answer that. But what I can do is give you an, an analogy that when you look at, uh, at spring-loaded things, for instance, um, it only makes sense to do spring-loaded behaviors like jumping or or, or all the behaviors that I showed you, if you're only a certain size. Um, the cutoff is usually a frog. The size of a frog is combining some elements of direct muscle action and some elements of, of, of spring-loaded mechanisms. If you're above a frog in mass, uh, it doesn't really make sense to use spring-loaded mechanisms because you can get more sort of power output by direct 
muscle action because you have bigger muscle volume. But when you're small and you're sort of your mass is small, you have less muscle volume. So the sort of rules are different for things on different scales. So uh, it's probably some sort of scale argument, not directly that, but in, in some sort of anatomical argument that I don't, I don't know. So Adrian, when you're thinking about what research projects to take on, yeah, and what media might come from those projects, mm -hmm. do you think, like I could imagine uh, somebody might say, film the blue morpho in slow motion. Right. Because that's a big, bright colored butterfly, and it's somewhat well known, to, it's, that's the emoji yeah. for a butterfly. Yeah. So that has like a sort of instant public appeal, yeah. but also we're, we're here to do science. Right. How do you find balance between the public side and the stuff that might be interesting to your professional colleagues? Yeah, I, well, I sort of put, I have two rules in place for myself for media making that help merge the media making with the science, is that whenever I make a piece of media and publish it on whatever, PBS or, or, or YouTube, um, it has to, one, be something new. Be filming or capturing something or telling some story that I feel like hasn't been told before. It's easy to do with insects because most of them haven't been looked at at this sort of scale before. Some of them have, like morphos. Um, that's one of the reasons I haven't done a, like a bee flight video because I feel like a lot of bees have been done before. Um, so I usually try to go after things that I know haven't been filmed before. So a lot of the things that I film may or may not be scientifically productive, but there's always a possibility of that because I know someone hasn't captured this thing before. Um, or told this person's story before, too. Um, with the bat fly video, uh, for instance, no one had, had, had made a piece of media about what Lisa does in the mammal collection and her passion of bats, so I was like, Lisa, let's do something. And I can theme it around um, bat flies, because I really want to see one. And that's my other rules. There has to be a reason for me to be the one telling the story. So it has to be some sort of arthropod insect connection there. So went out with Lisa, caught a bat fly, filmed it, and we're able to show like what Lisa's work is and what this cool insect is. And it turns out that no one had actually filmed uh, those, those flapping halteers, those flapping gyroscopes, in a completely wingless, in quotes, uh, fly before, which bat flies don't have that front pair of wings. Uh, it was unknown whether or not wingless, truly wingless flies have halteers that flap. And so that footage you saw is the first instance of that. So that, you know, as soon as I put out the video, a fly researcher emailed me and was like, hey, no one's filmed this before. We're writing a paper about, you know, halteers flapping in non-flying situations. Can we use this data? I was like, sure, great. So that's, that's kind of how it fits together. So, you know, I try to film stuff that can lead to science or be part of the science itself. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have read that a lot of these high-speed things, scopic lighting, and but you're not using a strobe. No, yeah. Yeah, I don't use a strobe. A strobe was a, a common way to do it, and it still is by, by uh, certain people, for sure. Um, but I don't, um, I can't predict when the thing is going to happen. I kind of need constant light. Uh, because I'm, again, usually don't use restrained stuff, and um, I don't know what's going to happen when I put an insect on a platform and, you know, try to get it to jump. I, like, I don't know exactly when that's going to happen. So it's hard to line up a strobe with the unknowns. So it's, you know, I'm usually flicking on and off a light um, in trying to time it right uh, with whatever the insect is doing. Uh, second question. <clears throat> and the ones that use the, the latch mm -hmm. mechanism, Mm -hmm. What serves as the trigger to, to release that latch? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. Um, for instance, trap giants that walk around with a bear trap strapped to the front of their face. They can use their jaws normally to do stuff. They can pick up their larvae. They can dig a hole and build a nest, right? Um, so w even when they have them open and they're loaded, their spring is internally loaded, they're only going to snap if they're in the right motivational state. And they snap because they have two trigger hairs that stick out from where each mandible hits the, hits the head. So when something bumps into that trigger hair, that is in range to be hit by the mandibles. So that would normally release the mandibles. But that trigger only works 
when the ant is in the right motivational state. Like it can have its jaws open and just, you know, not be sort of loaded or aggressive. And those trigger hairs can be hit and then send the signal to the to the muscle and to the ant. But if it's not, if everything else isn't coordinated, if it's not actually motivated or primed to do it, it doesn't snap. Um, so it's it's all sort of it's not, it doesn't work exactly like a mindless mousetrap would. There's still kind of motivation and priming of the rest of the neurons that needs to happen. How do they, how do the animals provide a forcing function? That's the spring, you could be hydraulic. Mm -hmm. What mechanisms do they use besides those to do those sorts of things to, You've got the latch, but now you're, you're releasing the energy. Yeah. What's storing the energy, I guess yeah. is the word. It's usually uh, hardened parts of the cuticle. So, there, you know, insects have an exoskeleton that is usually a, a hard part, and, um, so, and that can vary in hardness, too. So a lot of them have modified parts of their body that are hardened cuticle plates or rods or apodemes that muscles attach to that are stretched when the muscle directly pulls on it, and those can be released and sort of flex back into, into shape. Um, for instance, trap jaw ants, actually, when they load their spring, you can see their entire head case sort of bend and deform. And then when they release their snap, it pops back out like that. So some of them, it's some, sometimes it's really hard to prove what actually works as a spring, because sometimes it's distributed. It's not a single thing. Um, but you can see components of their, of their hardened cuticle like deforming and then springing back into place. Yeah. I, uh, often when we come down to Daily Planet Cafe and uh, a scientist presenting something about, well, for example, I remember the one on spiders. Yeah. Um, they study the interrelationship between the bugs uh -huh. and other things in nature. Mm -hmm. Do you have any of those studies? Yeah, for sure. So uh, for a decade or so, I worked on uh, the trap jaw ant, which you saw briefly uh, there. And the things that it feeds on and why it evolved a uh, trap jaw was to capture things like springtails. Um, so now I'm kind of on the other end of that relationship and studying those. Um, so oftentimes I, I, I mostly focus on describing a single organism and a single sort of behavior, not kind of the ecology of it. Um, but I am sort of interested in comparing between closely related species, like how they accomplish the same thing and how that function evolves or that behavior or communication instance evolves. Um, and I think in, the, in, the, in a broader scale, uh, I've sort of switched from working on the predators to working on the prey uh, right now. So I'm kind of in the prey phase of, of working on it. And all of this, will, I think, will eventually come together, but it might take a while. Yeah. I've got one from the web for you. OK, great. Uh, one of I our web. viewers wanted to know what you think the main theory is that's important for new discoveries in bugs, like uh, like if Darwin has the theory of evolution, mm. is there some overarching thing about insects that guides research? Wow. Well, I have to. I have. I. I, I don't have a good answer for that because I, uh, I have to confess I'm not very big-brained. I kind of don't think of the big things. I kind of concentrate on the instances of individuals and and organisms. Um, uh, I, I don't ask those big of questions myself as a scientist, so it's hard for me to get in the headspace of that. Um, it's kind of like not the scale that I work on. I'm more interested in the details, and I can't help but be a stamp collector at heart. Um, yeah. Although I feel like they answered it when, with the Darwin example. Yeah, there you like, go. Like sure. this, this is the study of evolution. Yeah. It's just at a different scale. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. I'm curious about the muscles. You uh -huh. mentioned the muscles. How are the, the actual the muscle tissue different or similar to larger animals? Yeah, uh, th they're not that different uh, from larger animals. <coughs> um, the, they work like, th to build these springs, there are often more muscle tissue attached to the things that work as springs. So they're kind of built up, and they've, they've sort of adapted to, to load a spring. 
<laughs> but in terms of like muscle physiology, I'm not quite sure, but there's uh, not major differences. When we, when we do things like calculate how much muscle mass they're using to power something, we use the same sort of uh, power formula to calculate this mass of muscle can produce this much power as people use for studying vertebrates. So we use the same sort of parameters for that, for, for describing like how much power output can this mass of muscle make. Um, so kind of our assumptions are built into the being relatively similar. Hi, do you have hey. um, occasionally uh, other uh, researchers reach out for uh, assistance uh, coordinating with your work? Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. Like the springtail stuff, um, the the CT scan work uh, and sort of the anatomy work is uh, with a researcher in Germany, um, Fabio. He's he's we're, we had a paper accepted yesterday about that work. Um, and then some of the kinematic performance data of swing tails like flying through the air and stuff is in collaboration with um, Dr. Jacob Harrison, who uh, used to be at Duke, uh, but now he's at Georgia Tech. Uh, and so yeah, most of the stuff is collaborative. Um, I've only ever published one paper with myself as the only author, uh, and the rest are all collaborative. Um, so you know, I have my own set of expertise and interests um, and oftentimes I find the limits of those, and as soon as it hits a limit, that means that you have to call someone up and hopefully convince them that, you know, tiny springtails are worth their time. Yeah. How do you do a CT MRI on something that minute? <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the instances where I call up my buds and I say, hey, you guys know how to do this, right? Uh, no, they have they have, they have uh, micro CT scanners which have a tiny resolution and are and some of them only take you know chunks of things that are like that maximum, um, and it's it's I think it's a, the same technology base as a regular CT scanner, a human scale, but they're just meant for on the micro scale, um, so their their resolution is on you know micrometers level, um, and it's meant for looking at tiny things like that, and so. These, these aren't live scans, so you, you have to fix the insect in some sort of fixative to freeze it and to sort of uh, preserve its muscle tissue in the state at which you know you want to look at it. Um, and then you send it through that machine and it, it, it's, it's you know looking at a, a small little chunk like this. Mm -hmm. Let's give Dr. Smith one more round of applause. Thanks. Thanks for coming here, Adrian. Thanks for doing this. I know you had to travel a long way did, yeah. down from the third floor. Yeah. <laughs> but I appreciate you coming and sharing everything, your research. Uh, so I think if you're not already, you will definitely now be following Dr. Adrian Smith on Instagram and make sure that you check out the YouTube channel Ant Lab. Uh, and you know, you can also just come visit the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, walk up to the third floor, put your face on the glass and go, what's he doing today? And you know, if you get lucky, you might see him switching those bright lights on and off, or working on research, or editing the latest video. You never know what might be going on in the research labs here at the museum. Uh, and we now know that you won't get fleas when you visit the Museum of Natural Sciences, which I greatly appreciate since I spend so much of my time here. Thanks so much for that. Hey folks, we'll be back here again. Uh, the Science Cafe date will be February 15th, so I hope that you'll come back and check us out again. Third Thursday of every month is when we plan to be here at the Science Cafe. So I wanna see all of you back here again. We're gonna meet some more interesting people who do interesting things in the worlds of science, nature, conservation, and more. And we'll have a good time here in the Daily Planet Cafe while we do it. Thanks for coming out. Travel safe, stay warm. We'll see you again soon. Bye everybody. Oh, and I'll come around and collect your springtails. <laughs>